Okay, so the last lecture of the mechanics uh, we have looked at the general equation of wave, harmonic wave as a special case of that and all that. Then we have understood propagation speed in terms of physical properties of the medium, that is tension and media mass density. These kind of things, the relation to power also we have discussed. So let's continue from that point onwards today. Transverse one dimensional harmonic wave produced by a simple harmonic oscillator as the source. So we saw that along a string we have the sinusoidal shape that travels with respect to time. So the snapshot picture of y versus x at any instant is a sine curve. The general equation is of this type depending on the direction in which the wave is moving. This type where omega is dependent on the frequency of the source. And k is equal to omega by v, where v is square root t by mu. So propagation speed depends on the medium's physical properties. The tension and the delay mass density, and of course that gives us this relation. So this also, and we have the general relation that the power transmitted to the wave is half mu v omega square into t square or Right, that is square root of tension into linear mass density into omega square into a square. Okay, so this is the essential point at which we had discussed last time. Okay. Now let's also talk about uh, so we have also seen particle velocity and all that. So del y by del t, the particle velocity is the omega cos. And particle acceleration minus omega square minus these terms are also there. Okay, now the significance of the phase constant, let's understand that. The phase constant phi that is in such a way that the value of the displacement, the transverse displacement at the point x equal to zero at t equal to zero. You can see it's k sine phi, whereas the particle velocity del y by del t at x equal to 0, t equal to 0 is e omega cos phi. So this, these two become essential in determining the value of phi. Just like in SHM, we had seen that initial position and initial velocity together tell us the value of phi. Because we, phi can be in any one of the four quadrants. So accordingly, whether sine phi and cos phi are both positive or both negative, or one of them is positive, one of them is negative, and so on and so forth. So let us see an uh, example of application of this concept over here, determining the phase constant and all these things. So this is a bit of a crucial part of wave mechanics. So make sure that you are making, you are paying attention and making all the questions and all clear, examples and questions and all. So let's say that we are given the snapshot picture of a wave at some time t equal to zero. That is given to us as a diagram. The information given in the question is in the form of the diagram. This is y in millimeters, this is x in meters. And now I'm going to draw the snapshot picture of the wave, which is like this. This is the snapshot picture. 
this is a snapshot picture of a harmonic wave at the instant t equal to zero. Where this is six, initial value is half of that, let's say three. Amplitude is six millimeters. So, this value of x is given to us as 9 and the propagation speed is given to us as 100 meters per second. The wave is traveling at a speed of 100 meters per second. So, given the snapshot of a harmonic wave, determine amplitude, frequency, wavelength, omega and k from this. Write the equation of the wave and determine the particle velocity and acceleration at x equal to 0 at the instant t equal to 0. Third part, we calculate second part if the wave is traveling along the negative x-axis instead, but at the same speed. So this is a bit of a tricky question in the in sense that, you know, hidden information. Okay, this value here is 9 in meters. But you can see that is not half a wavelength no? because x equal to 0 is not at y equal to 0 at t equal to 0. So to be a little careful when you adjust that information and determine the value of phase constant according to how the wave is moving. And from that you also determine the particle velocity and the particle acceleration at the point x equal to 0, t equal to 0. So the hint that I would give you is for uh, like for calculating the frequency, wavelength and all this, first compare the given diagram to a standard sine function okay, and try to understand the significance of that distance between the point 0 and 9. In terms of lambda, what is the value of that distance of 9 meters? So try to understand that by comparing the given graph with respect to a standard sine graph, then you will understand that. Okay. And then once you've got lambda, then you can determine frequency because V is given. Okay, so that first part gets done that way. Amplitude, obviously, you can see in the diagram. Now, second part, when you are determining the equation of the wave, including the phase constant, you have to be a little careful about the value of phase constant because you have to understand that the wave is traveling along the positive x direction. Okay, so how the particle velocity is at x equal to 0, t equal to 0, that also has to be taken into account.
Okay, people. So now let's take care to understand this relation between the wavelength and this. Okay. So I'm going to draw a series of graphs. Compare this given graph with the standard sine graph. Then compare it with the standard sine graph with the transformation. And then finally they compare the graph of this one. Understand the wavelength. So if we have the standard sign graph, let's say that's something like this, y is equal to sine theta. So this point is theta equal to pi by two. And the point where it's 0 0.5, the value of y, that point you can see is pi by six. So now if I bring this point to the origin, I have to transform the graph in such a way that now looks this let's say okay. So I have transformed it in such a way that transformed it by i by six units like this. So this has become the graph of y is equal to sine of theta plus pi by six. So that this point now has a value of 0 0.5. And this point will now become how much it will become? Pi by three. Where it becomes one. So now if I look at the graph of y is equal to e sin kx type. Mm -hmm. So e sin kx plus theta is transformed plus phi or whatever. Then this graph should look If this point is e by 2, this point is e, then this value of x1 and let's say this value of x2, we have this point is pi. So this point will become 5 pi by 6 because I have transformed everything by pi by 6 backwards. So now basically what has to happen is that this value be such that kx2 is equal to 5 pi by 6. This value has to be such that and multiplied by this thing, it gives us this difference, 5 by 3. This is 5 pi by 6. Okay. So this x2 corresponds to that 5 pi by 6. Now, in the given graph, this value x2 is given to us as 9 meters. So, therefore, kx2, which is 2 pi by lambda into 9 meters, should be equal to 5 pi by 6, is the idea. So, lambda accordingly should become ten point eight meters. This is the equation of the snapshot at p equal to zero. This is this and p is two pi by lambda, so ten pi by fifty four radians per meter. Okay, so compare this graph now, sine theta plus pi by six graph with this one. So here you can see that phi is equal to 
5 by 6. Okay. And therefore, kx2 plus pi should be equal to pi now. Because this point corresponds to this one. Just like in the first sign graph, this point at which y becomes 0 again is theta equal to pi. So in the second one, this point is which one? This point is one where theta plus pi by 6 is equal to pi. So that's how we are getting this point here as 5 pi by 6. Now correspondingly, kx2 has to be equal to 5 pi by 6. Then the wave speed was given to us in this direction. It was 100 meters per second. So use the fact that V is equal to F lambda. The frequency will come out to be 100 by 54 by 5. So 500 by 54 or 250 by 27 hertz. It's okay to have an odd sort of value of frequency like this because it just means that in 27 seconds, it completes 250 cycles. Per second, it does not complete a whole number of cycles, but every 27 seconds, it completes 250 cycles. So omega comes out to be two pi f, so 500 pi by 54 by 27. Radiance per second. We got the value of k, we got the value of omega. Amplitude was already given in the question indirectly through the diagram. It's six millimeters. So we've got amplitude, we've got angular wave number, we've got angular frequency. Yes. Sorry. Uh, why? Just a moment. We have. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. It's double of this. Yeah. It's... Just make a correction. It's the wavelength is double of this actually. It's hundred and eight by. Five meters, so it is
Okay, so hope the values are all right now. Man. Okay. Now we come to the slightly tricky point that how we are writing the wave equation. Okay, so for the second part, the wave is traveling along the positive x uh, direction. So let us say, suppose we write the wave equation like this: y is equal to e sine. Suppose we write it like this: omega t minus k x plus phi. Then our particle velocity is e omega cos omega t minus k x plus phi. Now, from the wave, what we can see is that it's not just about the position at x equal to zero, t equal to zero. It's also the direction of motion. So, what is happening? The wave is traveling in this direction. So, next moment, the wave will be like this. This will be the picture at delta t time because this is the snapshot picture at t equal to zero. It's having a particle velocity which is downwards. Okay, the point at x equal to zero. So you can see that y at x equal to zero, t equal to zero, was plus three millimeters. So that is telling us that according to this wave equation, e sine phi should be equal to e by two. So phi should be sine inverse half. But as you know from SHM, this has two solutions. Okay, so we still also need to understand what is the particle velocity at x equal to zero, t equal to zero, and that is a omega cos phi, and that is what kind of quantity? It is a negative quantity. Okay, Snigita, I will show, show the question once more. Okay. So according to this, cos phi should be negative. So sine phi is half and cos phi is negative. So these two things together tell us that phi is equal to pi pi by six. So if we write the equation this way, it would be that it is six sine omega, which remember was I think one two fifty divided by 27, right? Yeah. 250 pi divided by 27. T minus kx. Now k was similarly. K's value was 5. Uh, by 54 that comes here x plus 5 pi by 6 this is one way of writing the equation this, there's another way of writing it also and we will see that both trigonometrically as well as by using the initial conditions anyhow so just taking you back to the question once. Okay, so let's come back to this. Okay, so this was the first thing, Snigita, that we determined the wavelength. And then from the wavelength, the frequency, because the wave speed was given to us. Just make a quick run through of this part also. Might have missed this. And then we'll come to the final part where we're determining the phase constant.
Yes, Aditya, I'm scrolling down. Aditya and Suman, uh, okay. Just a moment. Okay, so this is one way to approach the question. Okay, now another way to approach the question is we could have also started with, with the wave equation being like this, that we take the general equation as A sine kx minus omega t plus phi. The important thing is that the sign between omega t and kx has to be negative because the wave is traveling along the positive x direction. It has to be either kx minus omega t plus phi or omega t minus kx plus phi. Both will do for writing the general equation, but the sign has to be negative because the wave travels along the positive x axis. If you start with this, you'll see you'll get a different equation compared to this one. You'll get a different phase constant, but the equation is equivalent. Okay. Here we are getting the equation of this type. E sine omega t minus kx plus pi pi by 6. Here we'll get a different equation. We'll get it kx minus omega t plus some phase constant. Now that is why you have to be careful between the two. Okay, so same thing if you start with this one, huh? you get del y by del x, I'm sorry, del y by del t is minus k omega cos kx minus omega t plus phi. In this, what we get is And you look at the snapshot picture and you still understand that the particle velocity at x equal to 0, t equal to 0, which according to this equation now is minus e omega cos phi, that is a negative quantity. So according to this, cos phi should be negative. If I go with this notation here, then the cos phi should be positive. So phi should be in first quadrant. Here we had five was in the second quarter. So five will come out to be five by six. So this will now give us that y is equal to a sine kx minus omega t plus pi by six. You can see that this equation is the same as this equation. These two are equivalent because you have to just use the concept that e sine pi minus alpha is equal to sine alpha. And then substitute the value of alpha as this whole thing. Kx minus omega t plus pi by six. So you get, you substitute alpha as this. And you get, you get this whole term pi minus alpha. Omega t minus kx plus 5 by 6. 
these two are the same things. So basically, what is happening here is that sine omega t minus kx plus pi pi by six is the same graph, is the same relation, same function as sine kx minus omega t plus pi by six. And in fact, that is also the same thing as cos of omega t minus kx plus pi by three. And other such terms also you can. So this is where things can get a little bit complicated when you are looking at the J advanced type of questions to do with wave equations and you have multiple options and all that. You have one has to be really very careful with this. Okay. So now also try the last part of the question. If we are assuming the wave to be traveling along the negative x direction, then what kind of change we make to the equations? Very good, Naman, that's correct, because now you can see that if the wave is traveling along the negative x direction, then the particle velocity at y is equal to zero, sorry, at x equal to zero, t equal to zero will change. It will be upwards. So del y by del t at x equal to zero, t equal to zero will now become a positive quantity instead of negative. Because the wave is moving in a different way now. It's traveling This is our snapshot picture at t equal to zero, but the wave is traveling along this direction. So now this will become like this. So the particle velocity is upwards at this point. This particle is going upwards in this point. You can see that y at x equal to 0, t equal to 0 is plus a by 2 and del y by del t at x equal to 0, t equal to 0 is positive. Now for a wave traveling along the negative x direction, this sort of a wave, we write the equation as general equation as a sine kx plus omega t or omega t plus kx plus pi over t. So del y by del t, particle velocity, becomes k omega cos kx plus omega t plus pi. So this thing tells us that d sine phi is a by 2. And this thing tells us that k omega cos phi is positive. So sine phi is plus half. Cos phi is positive. 
That means phi should be phi by six. So we'll first spot it. So if the wave was traveling in the negative x direction instead, then we will have to write it as e sine omega t plus k x plus phi by six. Omega was 250 by 27 pi and pi pi by 15 pi. Now one more thing we have to do in the question. We have to determine the particle velocity and acceleration in the second part. This is the third part. So I'll come back to the second part and do that. But that's quite simple actually. We just substitute the values. So it's nothing to do.
Okay, so let's understand the particle velocity and particle acceleration in the second part. Okay. Coming back to the second, this is the third part that we are describing along the negative x direction. On the second part, that we are describing along the positive x direction, and I want to write the equation. We we'll come to this. Okay, now from this we can see that particle velocity. T omega cos i pi by six, so it is minus root three by two t omega, and we know a and omega, so we can calculate it directly. And delta two y by delta t square, or the particle acceleration, basically this minus omega square into y, and y was three by two. This that x equal to zero, t equal to zero. The value of y was k by two. That's something quite simple. Okay, can understand this here. Okay, so a little bit more about general equation of wave here, power and all that. Okay. Now moving on to another aspect. So we will look at superposition of waves. And right now we are talking in context of one-dimensional transverse waves. We we'll later expand this idea. Mechanical waves. Yeah. Now, the first type of superposition we study is something called interference. So, interference is a very specific term that is used when multiple waves of very important identical frequency. So, traveling along the same string in the same direction. On a string, they overlap, superimpose. So when this happens, the superposition of this type of specific waves, that is, they are traveling in the same direction and they are in the same frequencies. So when such type of waves superimpose or overlap, the resulting phenomena, which we will study in detail now, is called interference. Okay. This is a definition of interference, which is contextual to one dimensional transverse harmonic waves. So the condition for interference to occur as a phenomena is double that over here. Two things that same frequency and traveling in the same direction of the medium. So we can think of this like an experimental example that suppose. The same string, which is infinitely long, they've got two sources going harmonic oscillators of frequency f amplitude a1, and another source here of frequency f but a different amplitude a2, which are creating disturbance along the y-axis. This is creating a wave of its own. So y1, this is creating another wave of its own. So y2. Now these waves are having common frequency. So s1 and s2 are 
simple harmonic oscillators. Attached the scenes. Oscillate and identical frequency. Yes. So the waves produced by them individually. Say something like this. That deliberately I have taken the phase constant to be zero. So this thing has tension T and media mass density. So now the wave created by the second source will be maybe a different amplitude, but the same value of omega because it has the same frequency. And therefore, the same value of x uh, rather k, but it might have a phase difference because they're not in phase. Where phi is the phase difference between the value of phi one and phi two at any point x equal to x at time. So look at some position here x equal to x. At some instant of time t, the disturbance created individually by the two sources would be something like this. Okay. So then the superposition of these two waves at any general sort of point p results in this kind of situation. So when we solve this mathematically, adding these two equations, we'll see we'll use the same technique that we've done in uh, combination of SHMs. And it will give us a result, which is like a phasor addition, very, very reminiscent or very similar to the vector addition that we've seen earlier. But here, of course, we're not adding any vector quantities. We are, we are adding transverse displacements along the y-axis. So the direction is fixed, it's not a variable direction. So I will just, uh, yeah, I'll take you back to the earlier section so you can just note down this introduction to just make a quick note of it. I think. And then let's come to the main part, which is the solving of this final equation that y is equal to y1 plus y2.
let's continue ahead with this calculation now. So some of you might have worked it out yourself by now. Okay. When we substitute these, we have a one sine omega t minus k x for this one plus k two sine omega t minus k x plus five. So in this, this is a quantity which is a variable. Everything else is a constant. So let's take omega t minus k x as alpha. So this can be written as k one sine alpha plus k two sine alpha plus five. This can further be expanded as sine alpha cos five plus cos alpha sine five. This becomes k one plus k two cos phi, which is a constant basically, into sine alpha plus k two sine phi, which is again a constant into cos alpha. So this time, let's take this thing as a constant. This thing as another constant. So this becomes of the type p e sine alpha plus p e cos alpha. Now you know how to deal with this. Multiply divide by root of p square plus b square. You can express it as sine alpha. Let's say cos beta plus. Cos alpha sine beta. Then you can see that cos beta is a upon root of a square plus b square. Sine beta is b upon root of a square plus b square. So finally, this becomes root of a square plus b square into sine of alpha plus beta. So with this one, now we can basically write this as. Y is equal to some net amplitude into sine of alpha, which is omega t minus k x plus some phase constant theta. And in this, you can see that root of a square plus b square becomes the net amplitude. And alpha is equal to omega t minus k x. So now we can understand that the net amplitude when we substitute a and b, small a and b over here, we get. A one square plus A two square plus two A one and A two cos phi. Beta we will get as tan inverse. Beta can also be written in terms of tan. So it is tan inverse of sine by cos B by B. So it becomes A two sine phi divided by A one plus A two cos phi. This comes here by just substituting a and b. So we substitute a as a one plus a two cos phi, b as a two sine phi. So this and this will give you this and this. Okay. So now having understood this, this becomes the standard formula that we use on this one. And as I told you that sometimes the easy way to remember this formula or remember the We even do the calculation for the net amplitude. The easy way of doing it is by just using a phasor diagram. Assume that it's a phasor addition. So this whole operation can be represented by this kind of phasor diagram.
So let's look at an example based on this a numerical example. Generally speaking, using the phasor diagram method is the easier way of calculating the net amplitude in interference. Of course, remember the condition for interference is that frequency should be same for both the waves. Without that, uh, you will not get the interference condition itself. So, I hope this part is clear to all of you. Now, let's look at the calculation of phase difference actually, how it depends on various other factors. So that is the critical thing in solving questions, etc. So, phase difference, fine, it can be created by path difference traveled by each wave. The respective source to the point to the point B at x equal to x. So for example, if the source S1 is here, the point B is here, and this is traveling a distance x1 from here to here, and this point S2 is the source S2 is here, and the wave is traveling a distance x2, you can see the path difference. x1 minus x2. This can create, this contributes to the phase difference. And secondly, can also be due to an initial phase difference. Between the sources S1 and S2. So, this is the situation where we understand that S1 and S2 must have same frequency, but they need not be, they need not be in sync, they need not be synchronized. So, that can also create phase difference. So, now we will understand this with a numerical example. How to do these calculations? So this is a string which has a given tension equal to let us say one thousand newtons and a linear mass density of or tension of hundred newtons. A linear mass density of 0.1 grams per centimeter. Now, what we are doing is on this pin, we have two sources S1 and S2, which are located at x equal to 0 and x equal to b. There is a distance d between them. S1 and S2 Frequency 50 hertz each. It's One point two millimeters and one point six millimeters, respectively. So, in the first part, if S one and S two are in sync, that is both started simultaneously at t equal to 0 from mean position with their initial phase constant as 0.
then and also the value of d given to us is uh, zero point five meters or fifty centimeters. Then write the equation of individual weights produced by S1 and S2 and find the net amplitude by their superposition. At some point P, which has a position given by x greater than p. So it's not between the two sources, it's to the right of source S2. So both the waves are traveling in the same direction as they superimpose at that kind of point. So you see here that while both the sources are in sync, but the waves that they create, they do not reach the point P in sync okay, because they're traveling through different distances. So I just wanted to just to understand this point about phase difference first and then come back to this question. Note down any key points if required. Back in ten minutes, you can just come to the lab for ten minutes. Well, let me buy you go later. You want me to send something back? No, I'll come back with you. Just give me that. People, I'm taking you through the question now. All the data in the question is important. If you just do what I've asked you in the first part, the A part, in the first part's A, write the equation of the individual waves. By writing the equation itself, you'll understand how to calculate the phase difference. And from that, how you get the net amplitude in the second part. Just try this out.
Okay, people, let's pay close attention to this and understand this question. So, first of all, what is happening very strong this data? Can calculate the speed of the wave, the propagation speed, reduce it to SI units, 100 meters per second. So you can see that while the frequencies are 50 hertz, so V is 100 meters per second for the wave, frequency is 50 hertz. So lambda is V by F, so that becomes 2 meters. So now suppose the simple harmonic oscillator S1 has a displacement given by E1 sine omega t and the simple harmonic oscillator S2 has a displacement given by E2 sine omega t. Then at the point P, x is equal to x. Now this one is located at x equal to 0. This one is located at x equal to 2. So the wave from this one is traveling a distance of x to reach p. But the wave from this one is reaching by traveling a distance of only x minus d. So at the point p, the equation of the wave, individual waves from these are going to be from s1, the displacement wave will be omega t minus t x. Where omega is 2 pi f, so that's 100 pi radians per second and p is 2 pi by lambda that is pi radians per meter and the wave from S2 on the other hand is going to be very similar equation but we will have to replace x with x minus b but it's just having a distance of so you can see that then y2 will be of the type plus 5 where Phi is 2 pi by k into b. 2 pi by lambda into the path difference delta x. So the phase difference and the path difference have this relationship. So in this case, now you can see that for d given as 0 0.5 meters and t equal to pi radians per meter, the phase difference is in fact becoming pi by 2 or 90 degrees. So this in fact becomes k2 sine omega t minus kx plus pi by 2. So this can also be written as cos omega t minus kx. So that's the first part done. Written all the terms. We've identified the value of omega, the value of k, and this other thing. We have seen a one and a two. But most importantly, the phase difference here is coming pi by two. It's coming from the calculation of this. Its value is coming out to pi by So now we can see that the corresponding phasor diagram will show you that the amplitude should become 2 millimeters in this case because the phase difference is 90 between 1.2 and 1.6. When we superimpose y1 and y2, it will result in interference because they are waves of same frequency traveling in the same direction and result in a net amplitude which you can see will become 2 millimeter. Just a minute, people, complete this. And we'll do another interesting second part of this question.
So we can see that the net amplitude here becomes because this will result in the net amplitude in the root of k1 square plus k2 square. You can also see that this phase constant will become 53 degrees. So in fact, if you want to write it in detail. This will be the wave equation at the general point. So that is about this part. Now we will see another interesting aspect of phase difference. What if the two sources had not been in sync? So let's try to understand what happens in that case. So second part, again, that distance d is taken as 50 centimeters only, but this time S1 is started after a delay of delta t equal to, let us say, frequency was 100 hertz, so we take the delay as 7.5 milliseconds. S2. So now find the phase difference of the waves and determine the net amplitude. Remember, S1 was the one which was at x equal to 0. S1 was the source which was at x equal to 0. This is the source at x equal to d. Now, this is started at t equal to 0, but this is started with a delay. So, as a result of that, what is the net amplitude at this point? You have to that. Just try this out, people, and through this, we will understand that if the two sources are asynchronous, that is, they are not synchronized, then that timing difference between them, how that can contribute to a phase difference also. So this is a crucial part of wave mechanics, okay, and especially like in sound also, this will be very important and later in wave optics also. So this is a critical part of this chapter.
Okay, so let's quickly finish this. I'm aware that uh, the class coming up for a few hours. So what we'll see here is that the equation for this one, uh, the first source, will be that y is equal to a one sine omega t minus delta, and the equation for the second source will be a two sine omega t. So they are having a phase difference. The sources are having a phase difference of let's say phi naught, which is omega delta t, in which you can see that s one is behind in time by omega delta t, which is hundred pi into seven point five milliseconds. So you can see it is three pi by four. Now you can see that the wave at t from S one, the wave will be a one sine omega t minus delta t, but minus k s because it's traveling a distance x. But the wave from the second one, it is a two sine omega t minus k x minus d. So something like this. So we can say that you know, like y one is like a e one sine omega t minus k x minus alpha kind of thing, and y two is e two sine omega t minus k x plus beta kind of thing. The alpha is equal to omega delta t. If we just saw as three pi by four, and beta we've seen before is k d. That was pi by two. So, as a result of that, now we can see that the Net phase difference. You like beta plus alpha. It's your two phases. This is alpha. That the phase difference alpha plus beta. The net amplitude This kind of data. This might give us something calculation heavy at this stage. So don't worry about that. The important thing is the conceptual thing: how we got the phase difference when there is both the asynchronicity between the waves, uh, between the sources, okay, as well as the path difference of delta x. So this is an important aspect of waves. Okay. So people will conclude our session here today. We have another session this week, uh, which is very important because I need to go a little quicker with waves now. So next session we will look at more examples of superposition, and then we will uh, have an off interference, and then we will look at the second type of superposition, which is standing waves. And through that we will see the resonant modes of vibrations of a stretched string. So that will complete this chapter, and then move on to sound after that. That's it for today's session, people. Thanks for attending. I wish you all the best. Thank you, sir.